We're closing out our series, The Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is teaching his inaugural sermon. I told you this week after week, and I have to keep on saying this, and I want to build this out for you guys. It's this first sermon that Jesus gave, and if it's his first sermon, it's got to be what? Really important stuff. And Jesus gives us eight key characteristics of what it means and what it looks like and what the interior condition of your heart should be for those who are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus gives us these uh, eight things. And the first one, we know it was to be poor in, somebody shout, spirit. And what that means is that you understand that there's nothing in your spirit, man, that can bring you to God. And that you are completely bankrupt that you need the grace of Jesus Christ, the blood of the cross. Which leads you to the second one where, blessed are they who mourn for they shall be comforted. I always thought that scripture was weird until I really studied it. And he's talking about blessed are those who recognize their condition and cry out to me, right? Then he goes, blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meaning, blessed are those who are humble. They're happy. They have a happy life. Those who understand that everything they have is a gift of grace. It is not of your own works. Even your job. God gives you the strength and the wisdom to work your job. God gives you everything you got and nothing you have is of your own. And when you realize that you are just getting resources and that God is the actual source, you get humble. And it causes you to hunger for God for more because he's the source. And so Jesus goes on and he says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. He goes on and says, blessed are the pure of heart. Those who have no malice in them. Those who with all their heart they seek God with their affections, their appetites, their desires. Not that you just seek him on a Sunday morning, but when you're going home, when you're at your job, how you drive your car. Can you seek God with how you drive your car? Can you seek the Lord with your whole heart while you watch television? So y'all not trying to hear that one. Remember when I was about 20 years old, I was down south, and we went to go see a movie in the theaters with some people who had gone to a youth camp. And, and this young kid, and my good friend named Josh Howard, he's a pastor down south now, and, and he's a um, great young man of God. And he got up, and he walked out of the movie theater because they cursed. And I thought something was wrong with him. I was like, yo, what's, what's, you good? He goes, yeah, I can't watch that trash. It's just too much cursing. It's just too much foolishness. And it was then that I realized, like, yeah, it doesn't matter if I paid some money. I can still walk out. Y'all not trying to hear that. They don't want to hear about right living. It's just, you know. I'll preach to you, John. They don't want to hear about, <laughs> about how it looks to actually, you know, make a choice for Jesus and be like, I'm not going to put before my eyes things that are caused me to sin. Yeah. He's talking about those who are pure in heart, who with all of their intentions, they'll seek the Lord. That's not being legalistic, it's being, it's living out this righteousness that God has given us. And then he says, blessed are the peacemakers, those who would make peace with others. Those who would make peace with their heavenly father, they shall be called the sons of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, and then who believed, any who believed, he gave them the power to be called the children of God. And it leads us to our last beatitude. Each one builds on the other. And these are things that Jesus would desire that we pursue all the days of our lives. It's not a sermon series we get past. It's a foundational pillar of our life that we should institute every single day to exercise. Every day, Lord, I need more of you. Lord, I can't make it through my day without you. Maybe you can make it without God. I can. Lord, I need you to keep me when I don't want to keep myself. I need you to help me. God, I, I mourn after the, uh, over the missed opportunities of my life. I mourn when I realize where I should be versus where I am. And I say, God, I've squandered so much time. Teach me and show me your path that I may walk in it evermore. And it, it should cause this thing inside of you. These beatitudes are literally attitudes that you should be. They're literally things that you should exercise in your life. And so as you've been taking notes, because Citywide is a note-taking church, amen. Praise the Lord. As you've been taking notes, because that's supposed to be why you're on your phone during service. While you've been taking notes, Snapchat's not notes. You would look back over it throughout the week and say, God, I realize what you're trying to say to me. And Jesus goes into this last beatitude and it's kind of weird. It doesn't seem like it's something I should like want to be. But the more you look at the New Testament, you can't get away from this last one. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, Jesus is about to, he's about to go into his last beatitude, but he branches out because the beatitudes are literally like, like a table of contents for the entire Sermon on the Mount. It's the previews, it's the opening statements. 
And he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of God. What? <laughs> That's just dumb. No, no, why do I got to be persecuted? Why do I got to go through a hardship for righteousness sake? And I want to talk to you this morning quickly because I'm really tired <laughs> about what it means. All the visitors are like, yes, I chose the right day to come. <laughs> what it means to be persecuted and three things that I've found in my life personally. Three things that I've realized when it comes to enduring persecution. Blessed are the persecuted, those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What a promise. Each beatitude coming with a promise. This one, that you have eternal life. Come on, bow your heads. Lord, your sons and your daughters have assembled in the heavenly sanctuary. And we come before you now just to be able to hear from you. Just to be able to know your voice. Lord, our heart's desire is that you would speak a word into our hearts that would encourage us this morning. Something that we can take home and put it to practice. Something that will give us a new perspective and vision for our lives. Something, Lord, that will change and shift our perspectives. Only you can do it. Somebody tell them, only you can do it. Tell them, speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. He, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And, and the first thing we have to look at then is what persecution means. And, and in different parts of the world, persecution can mean different things. And, and I've got to this place where, where I, my heart breaks for the church in different parts of the world. You might not realize this, but in countries like the Sudan, in countries like Indonesia, Christians are not only uh, mistreated, but they're murdered brutally every single day. In many Muslim countries, whether Pakistan, Iran, Christians are second-class citizens, and some of them die for their faith. In India, Christianity is not something that is popular. When you are a Christian, you can easily be killed, beaten, robbed, raped, and everything else. In China, much of the church is still underground. They have quiet, silent services out of fear of what people might do if they find out they're Christians. They have one Bible for the entire church and everybody takes a page and they memorize that page. And then they share that page with somebody else. People with missing limbs. People with all types of different bruises and scars on their body for the sake of righteousness. And what that means is the world, and when I say the world, if you're new to church, I'm not talking about the physical world itself. What I'm saying is the world system that opposes Jesus. That is the carnal mindset of the world that opposes the sake of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a satanic type of principality that opposes everything God and having to do with Jesus. And so in other parts of the world, there's serious persecution. Persecution that you probably could never imagine. I was reading uh, up on the history of the Apostles' Creed. If you have been in church long enough, you know what the Apostles' Creed is. And what it was, was that back in the early days of the church, maybe a hundred years after Jesus, they would make these creeds because there were so many false doctrines entering the church. The elders of the church, the fathers got together and they would make creeds that encapsulated all the beliefs of the church inside of it. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, was, you know, conceived by the Virgin Mary, all that good stuff. And, and the history of it says that around those tables were men with missing limbs and canes, men with missing feet, blinded in their eyes because... These fathers of the faith were being persecuted for their belief system. And you probably can't imagine that. And here's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not here to make you feel guilty about what you don't endure because you're not in some other part of the world. Because I used to hear that. You know, you should, you, should be, you, should, you should be grateful and we should, but they would almost try to make you feel bad that you weren't in somebody else's shoes. But our persecution here is different. It's social persecution. It's political persecution. 
It's educational persecution. You can't be a Christian in college anymore. You're a fool if you are. Because many professors are liberals. They're very liberal-minded. They're very atheist-minded, and they don't believe anything, God. And so you're not allowed to have your faith. Our kids can't talk about Jesus in school. And if your kid brings a Bible to school, they might get in trouble. If they wear a shirt that has anything to do with, with church or Jesus, they might get sent home. That's social persecution. You can't sometimes put about your belief system. You can't say that you support traditional marriage because now automatically you're a this, you're a that, you're a racist, you're all these things the moment you really claim to uphold this book. And so although you may not be dying for your faith, you can't even talk about your faith in half the places you go because you might lose your job if you share about Jesus. Because we want to believe in equal rights, except my right to speak about Jesus. And they take the Ten Commandments out of the courtrooms because, well, we don't want anything to do with the Scripture. We remove God out of almost every part of our government and then wonder why we have the issues we have. But then there's even that more personal persecution. That in our life, that maybe you're a husband or a wife who goes to church and your spouse doesn't believe in God and they mock you and they make fun of you and they persecute you. Maybe your relationships, you came to church and you love God and people don't understand what God is doing in your life. So they cut you off or they talk about you because they don't know God. Tell somebody next to you, that's persecution. It's maybe a different form, but it's still yet persecution. It's still yet a form of Jesus and us having to suffer some things for the sake of Christ. Some of you can't find a steady job because you refuse to work on Sundays. That's Persecution. Because they want to force you. Y'all not trying to hear me. And so we deal with social persecution in America. Where laws are written to kind of keep us in check based on our belief system. Where we're not allowed to have traditional biblical views. Because now it's considered to be unpopular. Archaic. But Jesus said this, he said, don't worry when people revile you and reproach you for the sake of me. They hated me first. They hated me first. And whenever you deal with persecution, you deal with people at your job, atheists maybe, or, or non-believers who mock you and make fun of you. I want to talk to you today about how to deal with these persecutions. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, Verse 12, I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. He says this, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that's you and me, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. I am in chains for Jesus. Now, you might not know what this means, so let me give you the backdrop. Paul was a mighty man of God, an apostle among apostles. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but much of his writings were written in times of persecution. Paul was no stranger to persecutions. Paul was definitely not a stranger to hardship and to going through some things in your life. Paul understood he was beaten, he was robbed, he was left for dead. They tried stoning him multiple times. And while he's writing this book of Philippians, this epistle to the church in Philippi, he is in jail. This is what we call one of his prison epistles. There was a number of the things of the books of the Bible that were written while Paul was in jail. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and um, Philemon were all written while he was locked up. And when you read the text and you see the joy in his life, Irregardless of his circumstances. Come on. And so he says, listen guys, I've, I've come to the conclusion <laughs> that what I'm going through is for the sake of Jesus. And it serves to advance the gospel. And so I don't have to fight back because the victory is mine, the battle's God's. I don't have to worry about how, what I'm going through because even my chains are advancing the gospel. Maybe I can't leave to preach, but my testimony by itself is preaching a sermon to those around me. And all the Roman guards and everybody in this palace knows the God that I serve because of the chains that are on me. Here's the first thing I've noticed about this. 
Here's the first thing. Here's point number one. There are chains that hold you and chains that mold you. There are things in your life that can hold you back in your own mind, but in reality, it's designed to mold something in you. And if you hadn't been afflicted, you wouldn't have seen the hand of God in your life. And if you hadn't gone through a trial or a tribulation, God wouldn't be able to refine something in you. Tell somebody next to you, you're not being held, you're being molded right now. And you might go through a, through a tough time, a season in your life where you feel persecuted. Even the church across America in many ways is silenced and quieted and is persecuted. But yet it's molding, it should mold something in us, a steady confidence. An ability to pray and seek God that we would call out for deliverance from our Father. In Acts chapter 9, verse 16, God sends a man named Ananias. In the beginning of chapter 9, Paul has just encountered Jesus. Jesus literally appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. He slaps him off of his horse. He beats him down and says, yo, why are you persecuting my church? That's the Lewis version. I'm sorry. It was my upbringing. I'm from Bridgeport. And he says, why are you, and he says, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus. And he blinds Paul, and Paul is sitting at a person's house blind, and God sends a man named Ananias. And Ananias was afraid because Paul had previously been a great persecutor of the church. He would kill people. He would lead them to jail. He would beat them. He would drag parents out of their households in front of their children, and he would drag them off to prison for their belief in Jesus Christ. He was a persecutor of the church. And Jesus says to Ananias, go tell Paul, Acts 9.16, this message, and among the things that God told Paul was, I will show him how much he will have to suffer for my sake. Because some of you have it in your mind that Christianity isn't about suffering. You have it in your mind that maybe because you're a Christian, you don't have to endure some things. You have it in your mind that maybe because you're a Christian, everything in your life will just be okay. Now, I'm not promoting the life of a struggle either. Because just because you're enduring doesn't mean you have to struggle. Just because you're being persecuted don't mean that you have to feel like if you are defeated. But I want to teach you today how to get through some things and have a new perspective that that relationship, that somebody might be persecuting you at work or whatever else, maybe God is just, you know, kind of equipping you with some patience. I've learned this in my life, that there's, there's things that will hold you, but if you let it, it'll also mold you. It'll teach you. It'll, it'll, it'll kind of just help you in your life because what you thought you couldn't do before, you have no choice but to do now. Because you've been going through some things. And you've had to turn to God on every single angle of your life. Paul knew what it was. And he said, listen, you know what? Matter of fact, these chains, they're not holding me. They're molding something in me and in other people. Everybody around me knows about Jesus. Everybody around me, they're molding a steady confidence in people. It's, it's the Lord God working in me. It sparks something in others when they're saying, why are you happy while you're chained up, Paul? Why do you have joy unspeakable? At the end of Philippians, Paul says, I've learned to be content in every situation of my life. Why? Because because God has built up in me a steady confidence. These chains are molding something in me. I'm becoming more humble, more meek. These chains are developing in me a patience, a trusting in the Lord, an ability to lean on God, to be still and know that he is God. Some of you find all of your identity in what you do, not whose you are. And God's like, no, sometimes you need to be broken so I can just tell you, wait and trust me as I process your life. You're not being held back. God is molding some things in you because if you let you go right now, you might wreck yourself. And sometimes when you deal with persecution in your life in any type of form, you have to realize that Jesus was hated first. He says in John 15, hey, by the way, guys, if anybody hates you, just remember they hated me first. As a matter of fact, the world doesn't hate you. They hate the Christ in you. I'll prove it to you because the friends who will turn their back on you because you won't go out with them anymore, if you call them to go out with them, they would go with you. If you turn from Jesus, they would re befriend you with death. But if you keep Jesus, I don't want that. It's not you they got a problem with, it's Jesus. They like you, they don't like the Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's not because they're evil, it's because they're blinded to the things of, this, of, the, of the world. To them it's foolishness, to you it's the power that saves. 
And so Paul realizes I got this steady confidence in me because even my chains are advancing the gospel. Even my, my problems are helping me get closer to God's agenda. Even my issues are helping me draw closer to God's promises. Even what I think is going to break me is only going to bless me. Because what I thought when I was going to jail, Paul, I, I thought it was going to be bad because I wouldn't be able to preach. And I wouldn't be, if Paul wasn't in jail, he might not have had the time to write the four gospels he wrote while in jail. And when you look at all the things that God did through his imprisonment, you realize that God wasn't holding him, he was molding him. And when the world sees you enduring for Christ, one day somebody's going to ask you, what are you doing to get through this? I don't know how you endured that, and you're able to share with them your faith and the cross of Jesus Christ. You thought that you were facing things that would obliterate your life, and God's like, no, I'm not breaking you, I'm making you. Things aren't falling apart, they're falling what? Into place. You have to trust in me and know that I am with you. Persecution doesn't hold you, it molds you. It presses you to lean on God, to press out, to cry out to God. Some of you know what I'm talking about because when you, when you are doing good, you don't seek God, you don't pray. But when, a, when, when calamity comes, you are crying out to God. You pray like you've never prayed before because you understand that I need him. He had faced Every persecution, this man Paul, he had faced everything you can think about. And Jesus said, blessed are the ones who face hardship. Anybody facing some things in your life today? Anybody facing some, some, some pain in your life? Maybe you're facing a struggle, a persecution of some sort. Maybe you're facing something. But you know what? Jesus calls you blessed. You call yourself, I don't know why my life is like this. I don't know why I'm facing. Jesus is like, you're blessed. Look at that person. Jesus' way of looking at blessedness is different than the world. Because Jesus looks at who we have, and the world looks at what we have. And the world says, man, house, car, great job, six figures they're making, blessed. And then God goes to the hood to the person who has nothing but day and night to crying out to him in their apartment. And Jesus says, blessed. Now, I'm not glorifying you to be poor. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that God's system of measuring things are different than the world. I'm not saying you can't make money. That's not what I'm saying. Don't, don't misjudge what I'm saying, church. I'm trying to tell you that his scale for blessedness is different. When you're going through for the sake of the kingdom, just remember that he's molding something in you. Blessed are those who endure persecution for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Some people might not understand why they need to face persecution. You might, you, you, you might be like, well, okay, I get why he said that I'm blessed if I get persecuted, but why do I need to be persecuted? Like, that's just, I don't understand that. How many of us would say, like, God, why do I have to go through this? And I'm so glad you asked. I, I tell you, you guys really always, every Sunday, you always ask the right question at the right time. And that really blesses my heart, honestly. And I go home on Sunday, I said, God, how did they know? It's just, it just blows me away every Sunday. And, and you might say, well, why do we go through it then, Pastor? Why is that necessary? Well, number one, the deeply spiritual issue is because the world hates Christ in you. But the practical issue, the practical thing, what's the purpose of persecution? You see, what you might not realize is all throughout the New Testament, the entire early church was persecuted. All of them. Dying for their faith, losing everything they had, all of them going through hardships all the time. And we must say, God, why? Here's the practical part of persecution. Here's point number two. Persecution doesn't strip you, it equips you. It doesn't take things away, it gives you more. Now, you might lose some things of material, you might lose some friends, but it gives you more in the spirit. It produces something in you. It equips you with the spirit. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4.14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, that's persecution, you are blessed. You had an opportunity right there to really like, you know what, praise God. So I'm going to rewind and just do that again for y'all. Because I want you to be able to praise God today. Like I just, I just feel like God wants you to praise him too. Amen. And it says here in 1 Peter 4.14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. <laughs> like, again, the Bible's weird. It's like, 
So if somebody calls me a Bible thumper, that's good. I shouldn't be offended. If when I say, oh, I go to church, and they say, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I shouldn't take that offensively. When my college professor looks at me and is like, oh, there's no such thing as God, and you're an idiot, you should be like, praise God. Like, this is great. And you can tell him, he, he told me you were going to say that. <laughs> and because of that, I'm blessed. Again, the blessedness of the Bible is different than the world. He says, you're blessed when you endure for my sake. Number one, Christ went through it first. But here's why you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory of God, it rests upon you. That when you are persecuted, the Holy Spirit in another level descends on you in glory. And you begin to be equipped with all the gifts and the fruit of the spirit of God. When you are enduring it, it's God refining. Don't ask God to help you be humble. He will give you some people in your life who will test your patience. Yeah. Don't ask God, I'm telling you, don't ask God to help you love somebody because he will put some very unlovable people in your path. And he'll be like, you told me to help you love. You just want to love good people. It's easy to love nice people. But you got to learn how to love those who you feel like you can't even look at because they got on your nerves that much. Uh-huh. And so God, through persecution often, he will stretch you. Through your unbelieving spouse, he might challenge you to be constant in him and not lose your faith. To be constant in him. Persecution doesn't strip you, it equips you. When you go across the world to the persecuted church and, and, and the, you go to a kid and talk to them about how they lost their parent and how their father or mother was beheaded in front of them, they're full of joy that their parents were able to suffer for the sake of the gospel. You go talk to them and you're like, yeah, dad died, but I'm so happy that he got to suffer. Because why? Because the Bible says I am blessed. Now, my reaction to that is the same as most of you guys. Like, I don't know why. But the reason why is because the practical part of this is persecution equips you. Because God works in you patience, love, kindness, gentleness. Jesus called it to be blessed. To endure is to be blessed. The other side of this is that you can't blame every struggle in your life on persecution. The other side to this is that you might just be making stupid decisions that are getting you into trouble. That's not persecution. Persecution, Jesus said, for the sake of righteousness, not foolishness. Because <laughs> now some of you guys are like, I knew what I was going through. It's because I'm righteous. No, no, it might just be foolishness. Just, I want to clarify that because I don't want you to leave here with this false belief that everything in your life is persecution. You have to backtrack it and see, is God's fingerprints on the last decision I made? If it is, then I know it's persecution. But if it's not, it might just be my own decisions. You will know the difference between persecution and your foolishness. When, when you can really tell that through one of them, God develops a godly character in you. And it draws you closer to his presence. The key to this blessing is understanding that you are being persecuted because you are righteous. If you can tie your situation right now to so the way you're living for God, how you're enduring a hardship because you're choosing God, it's for the sake of the cross. When I was younger, my father, and, and, and he, was, he was working at Sikorsky for a number of years, and because he was pastoring a church, his work schedule became really crazy. He was making great money over there, and he gave up his job. He ended up being let go because of his work schedule. He wouldn't compromise. And if I'm being honest, it kind of cast our family into poverty. And growing up, we were very poor. There were some nights where we had to sleep with, the, with our coats on because we had no heat. We endured some serious hardship. i never forget the day the water company came and they came to turn off our water. We owed them so much money that they poured cement inside of the thing where, the, where you turn the water off in the street. They were like, they ain't never going to pay this. <laughs> Just forget it. What they didn't know is my dad had the same tool they had. And so before the cement dried, he ran outside. And just, 
Joke's on you. <laughs> I'll never forget those days where there wasn't a lot of food in the house. I'll never forget the days where we did suffer for the sake of the cross. I'll never forget those days. And I look at now and I see how God has blessed me, but I realize that all of my things that I have now are based on that blessedness back there, that persecution that we endured. And many people called us foolish. They called us crazy. They would talk about my father. They would do all types of things to my father as if he wasn't a called man of God. But look where God has brought us now. When you endure for the cross, you're able now to see the blessedness bear fruit in your life. He's not trying to strip you. He's trying to equip you. He's trying to break some things off of you that you have held on for too long. Have you ever, have you ever gone into your fridge and realized that, like, a lot of the stuff is expired? Like, old sauces and, like, just, like, barbecue sauce from 2014? You got a mustard from the first back to school event? And like you, you go and, and you're like, oh, I got to clean this out because my, my fridge stinks. And, and you realize how much stuff has expired. And if you would just dig in your heart, you would realize that there are friendships that are expired in your life. Relationships that are expired in your life. And when you go through a hard time, when you're really seeking, not everybody's going to understand why you want to be at every night of 10 days of prayer. Your family might call you crazy. They, they might not get why you're singing so much worship team. They might not get why you're sacrificing. People might not understand why you tithe, why you sow every single. They might, not, they might call you crazy for how you live your life. As a pastor, you deal with that pressure. of People, well, he should do this and he should, he should mind your business. You'll always see me say it on social media. I got one life to live with my family. I had the greatest ministry moment of my life. I was, I, was, I was in front of the altar at New Vision, and I'm just laid out praising God. I opened my eyes, and both my daughters are laid out next to me. And they were praying. Because they were saying, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God. Father God, Father God, Father God. I thank you for Daddy, for Mommy, for Theo, Ann, for Titi, Jessica, for Kelly, for Bebby. I thank you, God. Daddy, I'm done. You're not done. That's prayer. This is intercession, girl. You're about to get trained right now. But to put that iPad down for I pop you. <laughs> Greatest moment of my life. And some people might say, oh, my God, it was past 9 o'clock. They should have been in bed. And I get that thought process. I do. But I have one life to live. And I can choose to send them home with somebody or to have them next to me seeing daddy do what God's called me to do. You have to get to your life to realize that there's some things in your life that are stripping you, but it's not God. God will take things away, and you might cry and moan about it and feel like you're in a situation of persecution, but God is building something. He's equipping things in your life. He's making room. Like some of you, you need to let go of some of these relationships because he can't bring the room. He can't make the room for your spouse to come in if you got so many girlfriends or just guy friends. God wants to, oh, y'all don't hear that one either today. He wants to make room. He wants to help you endure through the process. And as we go on, Jesus, he said it again. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But he goes on in verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I like that verse because that kind of even adds Christians to this now. They might talk about you. It doesn't matter if they're saved or not. People, people are falling, right? And they might talk about you. This is anybody, not just the world at this point. It's anybody who might falsely speak against you. Anyone who might speak against your life and, and really not be for you. He says, blessed are you. You're blessed when they do that to you. And so if, if I realize that, number one, these chains aren't holding me. They're building. They're molding me. They're making me into something else. And I realize the practical aspect of persecution is that he's equipping me, not stripping me of things. If I realize those two things, then I can get to the last thing I want to tell you, which is what is the promise of persecution? 
Jesus said the promise of persecution is that you would have eternal life in the kingdom of God. You know what I call that? Perseverance. That I would have the strength to make it to the end. That I would have the wherewithal to not give up even when it's tough. That I would have the insight in my heart and my mind, the wisdom and the intellect and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to know that even in my darkest days, he promised me that I would make it. That even when I'm in my deepest pain, he promised me that I would make it. He told me I would. He promised me. He said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He promised me that I wouldn't lose that salvation that I've worked for nothing. But he just gave me. And I've tried my whole life to work for it. And he just gave it to me. He says, I will give you the kingdom of heaven if you're persecuted for my sake. Point number three is real simple. The promise of persecution is perseverance. I know, I know, I know. That doesn't like, that doesn't sound real like, you know, fancy spancy to you. Like, you know, perseverance, like, I don't, you know. Can I get something else? Can the promise of persecution be like, you know, a million dollars or something? Like, but if you shift your focus and you shift your heart and you realize that without this, you just might not make it to the end. You see, perseverance by definition, perseverance means a steadfastness in doing something despite how difficult it is or how delayed your success in doing it is. Jesus says, anybody who endures persecution for my sake, oh, they're going to make it. They're going to get through it. They're going to see the goodness of God. They're going to inherit heaven. They're going to have eternal life. You see, Romans chapter 5, Paul, the same Paul who was in jail, the same Paul who was going through some things, Paul says something else that was real powerful to me. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Again, that backwards Bible stuff. We rejoice in our sufferings. You see, I can say that at a really heightened pitch with my voice and with the whole band behind me. And you remember, like, yeah. But what does that really mean? To rejoice in suffering. To rejoice when you're being persecuted by your spouse. To rejoice when all of your friends have turned their back on you. To rejoice you've lost a loved one, to rejoice when you're jobless, you don't know where the next rent check is coming from, to rejoice when there's no food in the cupboards. I know what that's like. I've been there as a child. To rejoice, to put God first, to trust Him, to have a steadfast hope in Him, to rejoice when there's no other option but Jesus, to rejoice. When the car breaks down, you can't afford to fix it because you're choosing God over everything else and you won't compromise and work on Sundays. To rejoice. When you got a baby on the way and you don't know how you're going to even provide for this thing. To rejoice. When you're enduring hardships of all types, to rejoice. When you don't know how you're going to buy clothes for your children, to rejoice. When you don't understand how you're going to provide food for your kids, let alone yourself. You're like, I'll fast, God. I don't care but my child. God, where am I? To rejoice. When people talk about you because you're serving God so passionately, to rejoice. When the world condemns you because you love a God that they can't see, to rejoice. When you're at home crying because you're enduring such hardship and such, such just persecution from former people who used to love you, to rejoice. When your mother or your father turned their back on you because you chose Jesus above all things, to rejoice. In the deepest, darkest times, of your life to rejoice when you've been in situations with your friends where you just want more of God but they just want to play around and you got to walk away from people you dearly love because you understand that the people you dearly love don't dearly love the God that you love you got to be alone for a season to rejoice 
to rejoice. To bring joy. My dad used to really have that down to a T. I'll never forget one morning where we were eating pancakes. And there was not enough syrup for all of us. And dad said, God's going to provide. I was like, dope, God's awesome, because I hate dry pancakes. It's a true story. <laughs> Remember that, Reuben? That's my brother right there. <laughs> We're sitting at the table, and Dad comes back with syrup. Looks strange, Dad. Looks a little bit weird. It looks like water. <laughs> I didn't know any better. I think that you put water in there, Dad. And uh, yeah, I was a kid. You know, I didn't know any better. To rejoice. When you wear your coats at night to go to sleep because you have no oil. Why am I wearing my coat, Dad? Because, you, you know, you didn't go to the North Pole in your dreams, kid. <laughs> I want you to be prepared. <laughs> All right, Dad, whatever you say, man, to find joy. Here's how good my dad was at finding joy in hardship. I never knew I was lacking until I was 14 years old, maybe 12 to 14. I never knew. Didn't have a concept that we were lacking because there was always joy. And Paul says, you should rejoice in your sufferings. And then he gives you why. Knowing, meaning having a knowledge of, the fact that your suffering is producing. There's a produce to your suffering. There is something that, that comes out of the fruit of your suffering. He says, knowing that your suffering is producing perseverance. It's producing a grit inside of you that says, I'm going to make it. It's producing a steady strength in you that says, don't matter, I'm not going to be shaken. It's producing a godly confidence in you that says, I know that at the end of it all, I'll make it. I may lose my life, but I know that I'll make it. So what they realize in all different parts of the world, they may take off my head, but all they're doing is setting me free to meet Jesus. They may take my children, but they're sending my children to have, There's a steady boldness and a steady confidence <coughs> that is coming your way. Because suffering produces something in me. And it goes on. It's like, a, it's like a, a recipe. Because my suffering produces perseverance. And my perseverance produces endurance. And my endurance produces hope in me. And hope is never put to shame because God loves me. And he's poured out his Holy Spirit on me in my heart. And he won't forsake me. And he won't leave me. Because I got him with me. I got a steady confidence to realize that I am going to heaven no matter what. Because the kingdom of God is mine. Because I've been persecuted for some things. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm not going to fear about this life. I realized it's a testing ground for my final resting place. His arms. Heaven, the kingdom of God. Rejoice in your sufferings. For blessed are you who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you. When Jesus says that you are blessed, you are blessed. Blessed are you. And there might be some here today who say, you know, I'm just not seeing it, Pastor. I get what you said, and it sounds really good in theory, but the, 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 the reality of it is I'm still hurting and I'm still suffering. Nobody said persecution won't hurt. We just know that there's help. But here's what Paul would go on to say in Romans, the eighth chapter, because these books of the Bible are written as one long letter. They were never divided into chapters until a couple hundred years ago. And so you should read it all as one letter. And in chapter 8, Paul says, I don't count my present sufferings to be able to be compared to the future glory that awaits me. In other words, no matter what I face in this world, 
no matter how bad things may look on this side of heaven, I would never compare my sufferings to be able to be even remotely comparable in the smallest, most minute facet to the glory that awaits me in heaven. What are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying to you is that the small pain here in this life that almost makes you feel like you want to quit, but you can't because he gave you perseverance. That you want to give up, but you can't because he gave you endurance. That are moments where you wanted to just call it, I'm done, I can't, I'm just, I, I love God, but I'm just tired of just this. He gave you hope. A hope that won't be put to shame, he said, because the spirit is in you. To you, he says, what I have waiting for you, you can't even put into context the great, vast reward eternity waiting for you. I don't consider my present sufferings, Paul said, to be comparable to the wealth of heaven that awaits me, to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when they talk about you, and blessed are you when they revile you, and blessed are you when your family turns their back on you. You're blessed. That's the real blessed life right there. Anything else is just an extra. But you know and have an assurance that yours is the kingdom of heaven. You see, when you realize this, it gives you strength to face tomorrow. It gives you a confidence to say, you know what? I'll stand up tall, even though I'm short. I just, as tall as I can, I just, I stand. I won't hang my head because I've been forgiven. I won't moan about my life because I've been chosen. I won't complain about my circumstance because God wrote the story of my life. And just because I don't like the chapter don't mean I have to hate the book. Just because a couple of verses don't make sense to you doesn't mean I have to throw away the whole book and say, this ain't working for me. It means that when I know that I'm enduring something, that I can say, God, above all things, I know you're with me. Some of you are enduring some hardships, spiritual, financial, marital. Some of you are searching for something new today. And I pray hope over your hearts, your minds, and your souls. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Do something a little bit different today. Now, if you're looking at me, I will come. I'm telling you. I've done it before. Every head bowed, every eye closed. By a show of hands, are you enduring something today? Small, great, that you need some hope for? Come on, just lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. If that's you, if you're not, don't raise your hand. But if you are, and you're saying, you know what, I'm going, I'm actually here. There's about four of you that came here today for the first time, and you're really looking for God to do something right now because you have a right now need. Well, I serve a right now God. Come on, hands up, that's you. Now I want you to do something. Come on, keep your heads bowed. But if you got your hands up, I want you to stand up. If that's you right now, just stand up. It's an act of faith. <laughs> I'm going through it, but I'm going to get through. I'm enduring, but I'm going to make it. I feel the struggle, but I also feel his strength. I may have some problems, but I have a book full of promises that I can lean on that has been good for thousands of years. Come on, I stood up because of the steady confidence rising from my very toes, rising up in me. And there's hope in his name. Come on, you stood up as an act of faith to say, God, everything's trying to keep me back, but I know I am blessed to be able to go through for your sake. I know that I am blessed to be able to endure for you. I know 
that even though the world may call my situation dire, hopeless, you call it, somebody shout, blessed. And your opinion means more of me than anybody else, God. Your opinion of my marriage means more than anybody else's, God. I am, somebody shouted, blessed. I may be going through, but I'm? I may feel hurt, but I'm? I may cry at night sometimes, but I'm? I may not understand every circumstance, but I am in Jesus' name. Could we take this a little further? I may have trouble in my home, but I'm? I may not know where every provision is coming from, but I'm? I'll stand tall because I'm? I won't give up because I'm? I won't turn around because I am? Somebody shout it out. I wish I had some help in here. I've come too far to go back now. I got too much seed in the ground to give up on my harvest. I am. We're going to take this up another notch because the band's going to help us out. You ready for this? Are you ready, church? You have to be able to profess this because tomorrow we won't be here. Tomorrow there's going to be no band behind you. So you got to get this deep in your soul right now. I don't know what I face when I leave here, but I am. All right. You guys are getting this good. You ready, Stephen? We're going to build up. We're going to do something. We're going to make some noise for Jesus. We're going to clear this until something just like, I feel like God wants to just flip a switch in your heart. Because there's some people, you're saying it, but you, you're about to really believe it in a second here. Hope is rising in you. If you believe that, your hands are lifted. I'm standing tall in this moment, in the midst of trial, because I am, I'm with him, no matter who's against God, because I am, I won't turn my back on him, because I'm, <laughs> y'all are doing really good, I don't care who's against me, because I'm, and if God is for me, who can be against me, I'm going to stand in my blessedness. I'm going to stand in my promise. I'm going to stand and shout and give him praise forever and ever. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to persevere because I am. There's hope in his name. Somebody begin to praise him right now. You are blessed. You are blessed in Jesus' name. I'm not giving you a blessing. He gave you the blessing. Come on, you can do better than that. Give him praise right now. Favored in Jesus' name. I may be enduring, but He's given me hope. He's given me hope in Jesus' name. I am blessed in Jesus' name.